So first, let's look at the origin of the universe, evidence for the origin of the universe. Now, at the beginning of the 20th century, scientists believed that the universe had always existed, that matter energy was, was infinite. It had always been around. Um, the model is called the steady state model because the model of the universe that it's been around forever basically doesn't change. The universe is steady state. But what happened in the last 100 years is that model has been blown away because of the evidence. Observations now suggest, as you all know, that the universe began some 12 to 15 billion years ago, and that at that time the universe was very hot and very dense and was compressed. We call it the Big Bang. But when this Big Bang model was first proposed in the early part of the 20th century, it was received with great skepticism by the scientific community. Sir Arthur Eddington, a cosmologist, wrote in 1931, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant. I should like to find a genuine loophole. And that was basically the philosophy of the scientific community when the Big Bang was presented. Because the scientific community knew that the Big Bang opened up the possibility of having a beginning and a creator and someone who began it. And that is not philosophically um, acceptable to many naturalists. But there were three experimental evidences that overwhelmed the scientific community, so that now we all believe that the Big Bang happened. And so since the evidence was so powerful for the scientific community to change its mind, I want to tell you what the evidence was very briefly. The first evidence that the universe had a beginning is the expanding universe. And I'll explain it like this. Here's the universes near us. And we happen to be this little asterisk right in the middle. If we take a snapshot, we see, um, I mean, these are galaxies. What did I say? Universe? These are galaxies that are near us, all right? And our galaxy is the asterisk in the middle. If we take a snapshot, it looks like this. We take a snapshot a little later, it looks like this. And still later, it looks like this. And what do we see? We see that the galaxies near us are receding away at a relatively slow pace. The galaxies that are far away are receding away at a much faster pace. And this is exactly what you would see if you expect, if, you, if there was an ex some kind of explosion or something right at the, at the middle. The galaxies nearby would be moving away slowly. The galaxies far away would be moving away quickly. So you might say, ah, oh, that means we're the center of the universe. Look at that. Well, let's make this the center of the universe and see what happens. So now the picture looks like this. And you see the same thing, that the galaxies nearby are moving away slowly, and the galaxies farther away are moving away faster. And one of my kids, I like to use this illustration. Here's the uh, universe, all in a balloon. And these little dots are the galaxies of the universe. And as the universe expands, the galaxies move farther and farther away from each other with the ones nearby moving away at a slower rate and ones far away moving at a higher rate. And then we have the big crunch. All right. Um, this was first discovered in 1929 by Edwin Hubble. And uh, it's the first evidence that um, the universe had a beginning. The second evidence, oh, scientists call it a singularity. So we'll go with that. The second evidence the universe had a beginning is the cosmic background radiation. Now, we all believe, we, we've come to believe scientifically that the universe began in a very hot and dense origin. Now, suppose that you were to have a hot, dense region in your house. Let's call it the oven. And you turned your oven on, and after a while, the oven became very hot, and the heat is concentrated in the oven. Later, you turn the oven off, and you open up the door of the oven. What happens to the heat in the oven? Well, it dissipates throughout the room. So after a while, the entire room is a little bit warmer than it was before. So if the universe began in a hot, dense origin, we would expect to see that residual heat still around. That residual heat is what we call the cosmic background radiation. It was first predicted in 1948 um, by Ralph Alpher and Robert Herman, and they said if the universe started in a Big Bang, we should see this residual heat. In 1965, two scientists at Bell Labs, Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias, were trying to do an experiment, and they kept getting all this white noise in their detector, this, this static that they couldn't get rid of. They soon realized that the static was actually the signal from this background radiation, that it exists. But the most amazing discoveries about the background radiation have come in the last few years. See, this radiation should be like a blueprint of the universe. And when you look at the cosmic background radiation, you should see a blueprint of what the early universe looks like. So if you look out at the stars at night, what do you see? You see a very uniform sky. There are stars everywhere. When you look in one direction or another, it looks about the same. Galaxies, stars are everywhere. But it's not quite uniform. Because if it was perfectly uniform, you wouldn't have stars and galaxies at all. Everything would just look the same. So it's almost perfectly uniform, but not quite perfectly uniform. And if the uh, cosmic background radiation is truly the 
blueprint, the signal from the early universe, that's exactly what we see. So in 1990 and 1992, we sent a satellite in outer space called the, Cos called the Cosmic Background Explorer Satellite, or COBE, and that's exactly what it saw. A cosmic background radiation that is almost perfectly smooth. We call it a black body radiation, but not quite perfectly smooth. Just enough to give us galaxies. Um, the leader of the COBE organization wrote this, George Schmoot. What we have found is evidence for the birth of the, root of the universe. If you're religious, it's like looking at God. Now, George Schmoot has been quick to point out that he's not religious, and he's not looking at God. But he's also quick to point out that if you want to make it God, that's what the birth of the universe looks like. The final piece of, uh, let's do one more quote. This is Paul Davies. He's an agnostic physicist. He wrote in The Accidental Universe, it's hard to resist the impression of something, some influence capable of transcending space-time and the confinements of relativistic causality, possessing an overview of the entire cosmos at the instant of creation, and manipulating all the causally disconnected parts to go bang with almost exactly the same vigor at the same time. See, it's almost exactly smooth, and yet, not yet so exactly coordinated as to preclude the small-scale slight irregularities that eventually form the galaxy in us. I want you to notice two words in this um, quote, particularly. An influence capable of transcending space-time. So what Paul Davies has said is it's hard to resist the impression that the origin of the universe was started by something that is not bound by space and time, something that transcends space and time. Now the final evidence for the origin of the universe is the relative abundance of light elements. If we calculate how much hydrogen and helium we should have in the universe, we find that we should have about 70% hydrogen and 25% helium. These numbers are now known to fractions of a percent. And they are, at, they are calculated and estimated to fractions of a percent. And it's found to be exactly true. So um, it's very clear now that the universe had an origin. And scientists have become to accept this. In fact, the equations of general relativity that Einstein developed had an origin of the universe. When Einstein developed his equations of general relativity, they showed that there should be an expansion of the universe and an origin. And Einstein didn't like that. He added something called a cosmological constant which he later realized was not there. When we, were, when we saw that the universe was expanding, that there really was an origin, he threw out the cosmological constant. And he said that that was the biggest mistake of his scientific career, was introducing that. But one thing Einstein never did is he said that space must have a beginning if the equations of general relativity are true. But he never said anything about time. So in about between 1966 and 1970, um, Three physicists, Stephen Hawking, George Ellis, and Roger Penrose, expanded Einstein's general theory of relativity to include time. And what they found is that time also began at the, at the Big Bang. So before the Big Bang, there was nothing. There was not space. There was not time. There was not matter. There was not energy. So the Big Bang was the origin of space and time. I should add, it was the origin of matter and energy. Now, originally, when this stuff was being developed, the scientific community was still very skeptical because philosophically, this opens up possibilities which a naturalist does not like. So the scientific community decided we better have alternatives to the Big Bang. First, we start with the steady state. That doesn't work anymore. Um, let's think about a different one. Let's think about something called the oscillating universe. And you've probably all heard of this. Um, Paul Gribben wrote this in 1976 as the steady state model was really being destroyed. The biggest problem with the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe is philosophical, perhaps even theological. What was there before the bang? This problem alone was sufficient to give a great initial impetus to the steady state theory. See, the philo philosophy drove the science. That's sad. But with that theory now sadly in conflict with the observations, the best way around this initial difficulty is, to pro is provided by a model in which the universe expands from a singularity collapses back again and repeats the cycle indefinitely. So this looks like this. The universe expands, it collapses, it expands, it collapses. And many people still think this is a valid model of the universe. I used to talk about this, and I'd give a whole bunch of reasons why this model doesn't work anymore. I don't have to do that anymore. And here's why. About three years ago, we sent a few balloons up in the atmosphere, one called Maximo and one called Boomerang. These balloons measured the cosmic background radiation so well that we can now rule out that the universe will ever collapse. This is a plot of two things. You don't need to know what they are. The mass density, the energy density of the universe. If the Big Bang didn't happen, the data should be up in this corner. If the universe is ever going to collapse again, the data should be down in this corner. 
And the region that matches all the data is right here. Okay. So this is so far away from a collapsing universe that we can just rule out the possibility that the universe will ever collapse again. What will happen is that the universe is going to expand forever. That's now clearly understood. So here's what we got. We got one universe. This is it. It had a beginning, and it's going to die. And that's what science now tells us about the universe. The observations and the calculations all reveal a consistent picture, that we live in a finite universe which began in a singularity about 15 billion years ago and is going to expand forever, basically. Now, scientists still don't like this. And they still come up with ideas to try to get around the philosophical implications of the Big Bang. Stephen Hawking wrote a book a few years ago, it was a, best, a New York Times bestseller called A Brief History of Time. The express purpose of that book was to get around the philosophical implications of the Big Bang. And here's how he did it. Scientists understand how the subatomic world works. We have a theory called quantum mechanics. And scientists understand how the world of gravity works. It's a theory called general relativity. But nobody has a theory of how the two work together, quantum mechanics and general relativity. So what Stephen Hawking did was he came up with some ideas about how general relativity and quantum mechanics might work together. And he said, you know, if this happens, then maybe we don't need God, maybe we don't need a Big Bang. And he, he squeezed all of that into the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang. See, we understand the universe from about 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang until now. And so if you want to try to get away from the implications of the Big Bang, the only place to hide is in the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So that's exactly what Stephen Hawking did. Now, there's two things about his book. First of all, it doesn't negate the idea that there needs to be a creator. He's very wrong in that conclusion. But second, it's not science. I want to talk to you today about scientific evidence for God. We can speculate all we want about other options, other possibilities, but that's not science. Science is based on observation and hypotheses. It's not based on pure speculation. And when there's no other place to go, the naturalist, unfortunately, has to go to pure speculation. But I want to stick with science. All right. And so what happened is, uh, oh, so here's what I'm going to say about that, blah, blah, blah. No oscillated universe. OK, so unscientific speculation persists, and it always, because the naturalist needs to find some way to get around the good conclusions of good science. So Robert Jastrow wrote in New York Times, for the scientists who live by his faith and the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there <laughs> for centuries. Okay. And this is amazing because Jastrow is extremely insightful. And here's why. The recent discoveries of science have been proclaimed long ago in the Bible. We learned this stuff in the last 40 years. But the Bible made these two claims long ago. First of all, that the universe had a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Science has just learned that in the last 40 years. The other thing that we, this, the Bible proclaims that science has just learned is that the stuff of the universe did not exist at one time. We understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It's amazing to me that a book that's 2,000 years old or 3,000 years old made statements about science that the scientific community has just understood in the last 40 years. But remember what Paul Davies said about the origin of the universe. He said, it's hard to resist the impression that some influence capable of transcending space and time began it. That's a weird concept, because time itself is a weird concept. Can you imagine thinking about something that happened, some cause before the beginning of time? And it amazes me, too, that the Bible is the only book, the only holy book in the whole world that explicitly describes a god who works outside of time. Again, thousands of years ago, the Bible claims that God is transcended, that he acts independent of space and time. And this is the only holy book that makes this claim. Paul wrote that grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. We just found out 30 years ago that time had a beginning. We have eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. The amazing message of Christianity is this God who's transcendent who is outside space and time, didn't stay there. That he invaded space and time. Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And that he did that because he cares about humanity. 
that he might have a relationship with humans. That, to me, is the amazing story of Christianity. John wrote, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So I'll tell you what the Bible says. It says there is a transcendent God who, get, who had a beginning, or, or who started the universe, who gave the universe its beginning, who made it out of nothing. That's exactly what science says. And the Bible takes one step farther. and says that transcendent God became a man, and he cares about you and me.